This week's sponsor, KR Couriers and Transport Limited, are best known as being a Northwest based company who deliver newspapers and magazines for local news agents and superstores. You'll find all the information within the description. Please give them a follow. Thank you. Hello everybody and welcome to the Billy Moore podcast and today's special guest is uh, Jack Cattle. Jack, how are you my mate? Do you want to put that mic up a little bit? Yeah. Good. Is that alright? Yeah, it sounds, yeah. Good. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Firstly, right, we know who you are, yeah? So tell us about the fight you had with Josh Taylor. How did that go? Yeah, so the fight is now, what, coming up four weeks ago? Yeah. Up in Glasgow. Home turf, by the way, yeah. Yeah, home turf. Uh, went into the to the lion's den, they call it. Uh, and you know what? I thrive off that. Uh, not on that magnitude, but a couple of my previous fights, I felt like the away fighter. Uh, but I enjoyed it. Uh, the build-up to the fight, the training camp, everything. Uh, I did everything I could to win that fight, and I won the fight. You did, but Obviously, yeah. them, them couple judges ringside and, and whatever else has gone on said no, but... You know what? There was a there was a couple of days after the fight where I was a bit down on that, but I've had to just draw a line under it now and move on. Yeah, but you want to be a bit despondent and disappointed because, you know, I mean, you know, ninety percent of the people that were backing you, you know, had you down as winning. You know, you put Josh down. You know, you were more like explosive in the fight. You were always on him. You know, and you felt that like there was a judge. What was his name? John Lewis. Ian John Lewis. Ian John Lewis. He scored the the wide card to Josh. Yeah, and I, you know, to be fair, mate, I've been, I've been to away boxing events and we've lost because we're on their turf. Sometimes that happens, you know. So what? Where's that left you though? What's it? Where's it left you in the rankings? We, we say we we've gone to the to the home fighters back guard and you get robbed, but it shouldn't be like that. Should it? We shouldn't have to. You win a fight, you win a fight, period. That should be it. You shouldn't have to go above and beyond. And Of course, I, I understand as a fighter, you're fighting the champion, you have to do more than enough to win. But yeah. the fact that like, the crowd comes into it, you're in his back garden. So we got the tickets for the fight probably five, six weeks before the event. My name weren't even on the tickets. He yeah. said, fight night presenting Josh Taylor. Yeah. So when I look back now, and I, I think of all these little things in the build-up to the fight. It does make you think, is there something more sinister that's gone on? Uh, behind the scenes, but we'll never yeah. know. Yeah, but the real the reality of it is, if you if you're not knocking knock them out cold and walking away that way as a champion, you're not winning. Simple as you know, you give it everything you got. The decision went to Josh Taylor. Fair play, you know. There's a lot of controversial comments around it all. I've got my belief. I believe that you won. To be fair, and that's just my opinion, and, and maybe yeah. you know other people. Will feel different, but that's okay, and that's okay not to have the same. Of course, yeah, the same voice. Um, it was quite unfair, but you know, you did. So you 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 were left in the rankings. You you know, how was your rankings gone down on that? So I believe the WBO have put us at number three, WBC number four. Yeah. Not too sure of the other governing bodies, but but they're they're about now. So, and like you just said, then to answer your question, where's it left me after the fight? It's been bittersweet because if it got my hand raised that night, we know that Josh would have activated his rematch clause. It was a mega fight in England, yeah. a life-changing fight, but uh, that's out of the question now. So it's about rebuilding. And I think what I can take away from it is the support I've had after the fight, not just from the public, but from from all the, the social media companies and inf influential people in boxing. So it it's been nice, but... For me now, it's just about rebuilding and getting back to that, putting myself in that position to fight for the world titles again. Yeah, and I believe that you know your next, your next, you know the next time you get that chance and that opportunity to win that belt, that it's yours, and you know that. Of course, and yeah. you can't, leave, can't leave it to the judges. I've got to go out there and uh, and do it. I mean, my goal always was to become world champion. I got to that point, but it was it was mag it was blown up massive. It was to fight for the undisputed. 
something that will never get back now because them fights are few, few and far between. Every belt was on. Every belt was on the line. It never happens. No. It, that was the first fight on, on British soil for all the belts. Uh, so that's a piece of history that we wrote that night. But uh, it still remains the same. I want to go out and achieve world titles. And in my mind now, it's about going out and not just getting one. I'm hungry. I want to I wanna do what Josh did before we boxed. I want to yeah. go out there and collect them all. Yeah. How did you feel, right, going into that fight, knowing that all, them that all them belts were on the line, right, and this was the fucking fight of a lifetime for you? Like you said, you know, it was massive. You know, and then you, you had everything, you were giving it everything. You know, you knew, you fought the fight of your life. Oh, it was, it was mega, you know what? It wasn't like the fight just got dropped on us. It had been bubbling for probably 18 months, two years. There was a lot of hurdles in between, so... There was Josh fighting with Ramirez before that. So it was mandatory for one title, but even to get a shot at that title seemed impossible. Somebody else collected it, somebody else collected it. Yeah. And then you end up with Josh Taylor. So we went over to the fight, uh, Ramirez and Taylor in Vegas, watched the fight. And even then, uh, I'd been kind of promised with a handshake that I'd get the fight against the winner. Mm. I was never confident if Ramirez had won that I'd get the fight. Uh, so I went over there to support Josh, hoping, you know what, if Josh wins, I'm fucking in there, I'll get the fight. And he did. So kind of when he won, it was a bit of a relief. And we knew then, but I'd been working for this fight, not just for three months, six months. I've been working for this fight since I turned professional in 2012. So yeah. uh, I knew that I had to do everything and more going into this fight. I think Jamie touched on it on fight week. There's always a point in time where you've got to transition from going from domestic level fights to the world stage. And a lot of people wrote me off and they had the right to because I'd never competed past a domestic level. Yeah. I'd had international fights. Uh, I cleaned up every fight in Britain. So it was it was that position for me to transition to the world world stage against the pound for pound fighter. Yeah, it's what an incredible like, like goal to, to get to and achieve, you know, because... Going forward now, what's your plan? So over the weekend, I've signed a new promotional deal with Probellum, which is a relatively new promotional company. Uh, and I'm excited. Uh, before before that fight, I had no promotional contract, so I was kind of a free agent. I've got MTK as my management company, and obviously you know Jamie, my coach. So yeah, big shout out to Jamie and Travis, by the way. <laughs> Jamie and Travis, good people, but yeah. Uh, the plan for me is just to get back to it. I went for 15 months before that fight with inactivity. I didn't have yeah. a fight. And a lot of people was asking me in the build-up, uh, is the in inactivity going to affect your performance, etc.? And I well, don't believe it rust. did. Yeah. Nah, no. I, I've always said, you know what, if you live like I do and you're in, in the boxing gym every day, it's what I know. Yeah, it's different throwing punches with little eight-ounce gloves on, but I live in the gym, so it was, it was just about doing that and transitioning it to the ring. So it's, it's normalised and you're conditioned anyway. You're in that position to just go from one place to ne the next. Exactly. A boxing ring's a boxing ring. I'm in that ring every day of the week. So I you talk about ring rust, I look at that as, yeah. as a shitty excuse. You look at fighters like Floyd Mayweather, they might go 18 months without a fight. But if you look at somebody like him who's constantly in the gym, perfecting his craft, there's no talk about ring rust. It's just, yeah, it's like a duck to water, isn't it? Yeah. With them, they just get in there and it's done and dusted. Yeah. So I've had the 15 months without the fight, finally got the fight. So the conversations over the weekend was about being active. Yeah. I know it's it's unlikely to get a world title shot in my next fight, but... Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I, like, isn't it? I do believe it will come, but more than anything now, I want to get active and uh, keep fighting. Well, that's, that, that, that'll happen. And, you know, we'll talk about the controversy after the fight and then we'll go on a little bit about yourself because it's about you, really, you know what I mean? We, we just, we're just going to kind of, like, address this this issue there was loads yeah. of like twitter social media conservation which it's quite upsetting I, can, I believe you know people jumping on the bandwagon you didn't win you didn't do this you know read all the comments yeah. and i think there was a, a lot of unfair comments because people were saying stop moaning stop complaining mate fucking hell. are you having a laugh are you having a laugh <laughs> i mean and i'd be the first fighter to say if the fight was close you know what fucking fair enough yeah. but what them judges have done is essentially robbing future. Yeah. Got a family to provide for. So it's not just it's affected a boxing decision, it's affected my future. So I mean people everyone's got an opinion, aren't they? I don't read into it too much. 
I've had a lot of support. I reckon 99% of the people online are supporting us, but you get the odd percent who are probably a Josh Taylor diehard fan. But yeah, you're paying yeah. on mine to him. Have you, have you spoke to Josh since, or has it just been through social media tweets? Uh, yeah, I've not spoke to him directly. Uh, I said in the press conference before the fight, I'd be the first fighter to, to shake his hand and have a beer with after the fight, but yeah. obviously it didn't go down like that. Uh, there's no, there's been no direct contact. Just the, the bits of social media stuff. Uh, petty, you know, pe- yeah. petty, and I don't like getting involved in it. But I think the way he's gone on after the fight has done himself no credit. No, and I've just had to let him know. No, it is. It's quite immature because it doesn't show any kind of adult responsibility when you're behaving in that way. You know, mocking, you know, a challenge yet, and someone who's turned up on their doorstep before the fight of his life, you know, and then giving him an hard time on on social media. I felt that was a bit unfair. But it happens, mate, and that's what you know, what what it is in life. Yeah, it's all part of the journey. Uh like you said, it, it is what it is. I mean Yeah, and that's what it is. It, it wasn't is. down to Josh. Josh Josh didn't make the decision. I think he could have gone about the decision better after the fight, but yeah. that's who he is. He's talked about not having the credit he deserves for being undisputed. Well if you kinda of look into the character and the person he is, is that why? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, fair enough. So anyway, we'll move on from that. Yeah? Yeah. So, Jack. Jack's a young kid from Chorley. From Chorley. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Which is great in Manchester, am I right? Yeah. Isn't so it? we live Chorley. I always say to people, it's a perfect location for me. I'm half an hour to the gym. Yeah. 40 minutes from Liverpool, so... I like where I'm from and I'm proud of it. So tell us a little bit about growing up then, because, you know, what's your background like? That's what... I, we want to know what was it like for you growing up in Shirley? What kind of inspired you to become a boxer? What were your dreams and hopes? And tell us all yeah, about it. So, born and raised in Chorley, born in Chorley Hospital. Uh, I've always been involved in sports. I come from a big family. I've got seven brothers and three sisters. So, who's the oldest? So, I've got an older brother, yeah. uh, Alex, who's 33 next week, and my youngest sister's. Seven. Wow, there's a massive gap. So there's a big age gap and I've got a lot in between. So it's nice. We're from a big family. We all support each other. But started boxing when I was 10. Uh, before that, my stepdad had took me down to, to judo and wrestling. So I'd done them from yeah. the ages of about seven. And I'd enjoyed it. But the boxing gym, it was always travelling out of town. You had to go wrestling in Wigan. You had to go yeah. uh, Clayton Brook for judo. So it was always like getting lifts off people and when you've got a lot of brothers and sisters, it's hard for, for your parents to, to be everywhere at one time. The logistics are quite difficult, aren't they? So the boxing gym, Charlie Amateur Boxing Club, it was a mile from where I lived at the time. So it made perfect sense. Uh, mm. My older brother went and I went down with him. I was only nine. He said, you've got to come back when you're 10. You have to be 10 to start boxing here. So I wait, waited. My brother in this point I'd, I'd trained and then scrapped it off he'd finished but I still wanted to go back and have a go Yeah, went back down when I was 10 never looked back since then I trained for a full year had my first amateur fight at Rivington Barn yeah. got beat a long time for that fight trained for a full year and I got beat I'm like no way but uh, I enjoyed the competitiveness of it yeah. and, and the training more than anything I think uh, the training's kept me in a good place mentally throughout the years so straight back to it again and uh, carried on fighting. So you bought 11, your first fight? I had my first fight at 11 uh, and I boxed every year then, amateur up until turn professional. See, that was similar, like like growing up to myself. Like when I was a young kid, it was like Keon Kata, Kratty, because it was all about Bruce Lee back then. Everyone was... Into Cobra Kai. It. Yeah, we, I don't even know. <laughs> fucking I, he was well, yeah, fucking grasshopper. We were going back a long time now, Jack. Um, but yeah, we grew up on... Uh, on all the Bruce Lee movies and we were joining karate clubs and that, but I didn't feel, I don't know, it wasn't really for me and there was a, there was a local boxing club called the Gemini. It was, it was the St. Ambrose ABC. All right. And I was like, it transitioned to, it got sponsored by Gemini, Gemini ABC and speak now, so I boxed for them at an early age from, yeah, I'm, I'm talking about like, they take you on at fucking eight back then, Man. even even younger, you know what I mean? And my first fight, I think I had about the same time, but it was 11, 12. You know, and um, I stopped the kid in the second round and I felt like a fucking rock star. Nah, you know what I mean? mean? And then I was winning <laughs> my fights after that. But yeah, I, I love like the discipline, the training. Yeah. I did, you know, I did the other sports, the judo and the the 
the wrestling, but they didn't feel as, you know, I always wanted to do more, I always wanted to be on the mat sparring, and when I was, I don't, I don't think it's as, con the, the contacts, I don't know whether it's, it's lacking a lot less than the boxing. Yeah, I mean, for me it wasn't enough, I wanted more of the, the contact, being in the ring, being on the mat sparring, and yeah, don't get me wrong, in boxing you've got to practice drills on the bag, but it just felt more for me, more physical. Uh, and I like that. As soon as I went to the boxing gym, I was like, you know what, I can have have a bit of this. So what was your drill practice on the bags like? What do you mean when I was amateur? Yeah. You know what, we went to an amateur boxing club and uh, shout out to Reese, who's who's still going to this day. Uh, Reese was my amateur coach uh, for eight years. Uh, and the discipline that he installed in us is... Uh, Probably won't be allowed now. Do you know what I mean? It was brutal. Uh, Tell us, share, share a day. He, he's, in the, he's an old school coach, so share, share a day in the go, life go of Go on it. then. So, uh, you know, you're in your boxing stance and he's teaching the fundamentals of, of twisting your body into your punches and you've got to have your back heel off the floor Yeah. Uh, to pivot and get your weight into your punch. If you didn't have your back heel off the floor, you'd get a little pin, sellotape the bottom of it, put it in the bottom of your boot. Your foot was off the floor. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And uh, you used to have like bamboo sticks and stuff. So it was discipline, but... What were the bamboo sticks for? <laughs> Fucking whack you with them. Yeah, just whack you with them when you're misbehaving <laughs> in the gym, but... <laughs> it's like these. <laughs> but uh, the other bits of the discipline that I think I've carried through and that a lot of people from our town has is... So you used to go in the boxing gym and if you didn't wipe your feet when you walk through the door, you get press-ups at the end of your session and they'll all accumulate. Yeah. And that was just one of the rules. So you wipe your feet and you go in, you shake Reese's hand, you've not got your press-ups then. Uh, there was no touching the walls. So you're doing your press-ups on the floor or your sit-ups. When you get back up, you couldn't roll over and come up on your knees to use your legs to get back up. You, know, you weren't allowed to be on your hands and knees. Yeah, yeah. there was no leaning on the ropes. There, there were loads of rules. But I, I, bet you, I can imagine you imagine you because you're fucking tired and you're exhausted and you're gassing and then you're leaning yeah. on the ropes. So you finish doing your crunches, you want to roll over yeah. and stand up, but yeah. you can't do that. You've got to... You've just got to get straight up, do you know what I mean? But it's them, them little things that over the years that instilled in you the discipline. Yeah. And uh, I enjoyed it. I think that's a, like, for me as well, boxing, like it, it, the discipline and the routine, that was paramount to me. I had somewhere to go and, and we got there and we'd done what we had to do. Yeah. You know, we the first thing we did when we got to the gym is we had to go on a run straight away. We were the same, Bang, straight out on a run. Get in, we go for your run, come back and then you're on the bags. Then you're on the bags, then you're on the then the pads. Then the pads. By the time you finish the pads, you're sparring at the end. Skipping upstairs, because we were we it was an old school bats and it was hot, you know, because the, the water was kind of the temperature yeah. had to be a certain level. And we had to skip upstairs and it was fucking booming, full sweatsuits. And we were only kids, you know what I mean? There's nothing about we never had a, any it's different. The amateur boxing back then is different to the, the amateur boxing in your day, you know what I mean? Because yeah. you, you would have been around about well. He was your, it's Swifty and all that. Steve yeah, yeah, they're a little, little bit older than me, but yeah, yeah not really miles away. Yeah, because they the boxing with the, the boxing techniques changed. I believe as like the the England schools developed. Yeah, I think like every sport, I think boxing was a bit late, but everything's just developing now. With I never got on any of the the GB squads or the England squads, uh, but. I know fighters that have and when they go on there, they're bringing in new science, new coaches, yeah. they've got nutritionists and the strength coaches. There was... Yeah, uh, that, I always... Because we never had nothing, nothing like that, to be fair. You know, we just got like... You sort of look, we're in the NEBCs, this bang, this, we're in this season, you've got this fight, this... Sometimes you're fighting twice in one day. You know, this is how it was back then. I don't know if they do it these days. I know that they, the, I don't know if they fight twice in one day, but I think they have a weekend where they can fight Saturday, Sunday. I fought in the morning. Won it. And then it's a fight in the, in the afternoon. I got Did you have to weigh in again or not? Yeah, I got battered. <laughs> and I was fucking led it. I was, I was tired, you know what I mean? Yeah. That was how it was by, for us. So what was your amateur show? You lost your first fight. How was that for you? Because I know your, your initial fight, when you've got everyone around you, you know, all, all your teammates. Yeah. Fucking hell. Oh, you have to go to back you? to school on Monday. And oh. You've been telling everybody for weeks I'm fighting at the weekend. Well, you're telling everyone in school as well. Telling everybody at school, like, all the teachers and that. And then... <laughs> You know what, I got beat, but I think, I mean, a long time ago, but I handled it well. And then I always remember my second fight went down to Birmingham. Yeah. And Mia Khan had just won a major tournament in the amateurs. So he, he he's led us to the ring. I was still young, obviously. Yeah. So I was still 11, my second fight. So he was on early. So I remember Khan walking us to the ring with, with his flag. 
Uh, and I stopped the kid with a body shot in the second round in my second fight. So obviously turned it on its head for me and I was absolutely buzzing. 50% knockout ratio. Yeah. So how does your um, how does your amateur career go from then on? Because obviously it's got a it's got a, a developed to a point where it, it it's top class to be to where you are today. Because yeah, so you know what I was fighting amateur, but I was still I was doing my school. I was still involved in other stuff, and I I loved it. And I think from where where we are, we're in Charles. We're out in the sticks a little bit, and you know you've got these big cities, Manchester, Liverpool, all in, all interacting, yeah. and all the coaches and referees, and it seemed a lot busy. We seemed like we was always kind of left out a little bit. Had a lot of fights on on home shows in the cities where probably should have got the nod, but more than anything, I just enjoyed it. Like you said, the discipline, finishing school, having to get to the gym, doing my training, and that was part of my life. Uh, and I boxed right up until I was nineteen before I turned professional, and I moved to a gym in Lee uh, for the last couple of years. Yeah, you know what? And I, I'd grown up a bit then. I was finishing college, and I had a good run of fights. I think I won my last nineteen fights which then gave me a bit of confidence because you're kind of in that crossroads and at that age. And my brother's there now. Uh, he's finished college. He's working. Yeah. He's trying to finish work and get to the gym. He's got a girlfriend. His mates are going out at the weekend. Life's busy. What do you want to do? Do you want to stay boxing? Yeah. Or do you want to... Is it a normal life? I don't know. Do you, do you go to work, finish work, go out with your mates at the weekend? You've got to make that decision. So it come to that point for me. Quite early, I'd finished college. I did a public service course at Preston College. And I'd be heart set on joining the military. Uh, and, and in that time period, I met a coach from Manchester who used to train with Lee Beard. And the opportunity come up to go to Miami training. And this was like three months before me. I'd finished college, all me. Is it coursework gets handed back in? Yeah. So I come home, I said to him, I said, look, I could turn professional. These are on about going to Miami for a training camp. He said, what are you going to do about college? I went, well, I'm finished in three months. Yeah, but you're on about going away next week. I went, you know what? <laughs> I put all my eggs in one basket. I said, you know what, fuck college. And I, after two years this, I went and shout out to, to my college teachers. They, they handed me coursework in for me and done yeah. it. Do you know what I mean? I still passed it. <laughs> <laughs> Go on the boys. But yeah, so you know what? We went over there, did some training. And this was like the development stage then. Yeah. Uh, Come back and my first fight, uh, September 2012 at the Ballers in Manchester. This is your first pro? First pro fight. Uh, won that fight on points and uh, that was like the start of the journey for me. Tell us about your journey because I've had... I had a, a, um, the likes of Tony Dodson was on one time. And Tony, Tony really, really, these are the, you know, really great career. But he talked about his fights and it was really interesting. And a lot of the audience loved the fact that, you know, you go through your fights. Can you remember your fights? How many fights have you had now? So I've had 27 fights. Do you want to go through a few of them? Just the, the most significant yeah, ones? Yeah, so, you know what, like, I would remember them all if they was in front of me on a piece of paper. You, got them, I, on, you get them on I, your phone, you get them up, But no, <laughs> like, the highlight fights, I can remember the yeah. fights that meant something that progressed me to that next level. So, yeah. I remember. So, when I turned professional, I had a manager, I didn't have a promoter. So, you're on what's called, like, a ticket deal. You sell your tickets, you get on a show. Uh, yeah, I've seen a few of them where you, you know, you've got yeah, to show. Yeah, so, so it's not a non-televised fight. So it's, a, it's a ticket deal. Ticket deal. So I had, I think, s seven of them. And it comes to the point then of we had a meeting with Frank Warren in London uh, to fight on what was uh, Box Nation back in the day. So I remember going down there and prepping myself to go and meet him, thinking, right. So what I'd done in the meantime, I'd gone on Frank Warren's website and looked what fighters he had mm. in my weight division because I'd seen the trend of the fights that he has. He's always having his fighters fight each other in-house. So I thought, these are the boys that I'm likely going to end up fighting. Mm. So I'd had seven fights, uh, learning fights, so to speak. I get down there and he goes, he put he put it on me. He said, why, why should we sign you? So on my feet thinking, I said, you've got him in him. I can beat him. He goes, done. So they give me one fight in Liverpool at the the Liverpool Olympia, an eight round fight. Up here, yeah. Up here. I'd only <laughs> ever boxed up up to a six round before that period. So I had an eight round fight. Uh tough fight, won it on points. So I'm eight and all now, just signed a deal with Frank Warren. Uh a couple months later the phone rings. Uh, we've got a fight against Nathan Bruff, Liverpool fighter. Yeah. 
So previous to that, I'd been to his gym and sparred him. We were massive, six foot two. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not the tallest, do you know what I mean? So it was a big fight. Uh, Nathan had been to the to the Commonwealth Games and medalled. He, he was highly talked about, do you know what I mean? But still, I'm on the young at this point and I didn't, I didn't follow boxing massively until recent years. Yeah. So end of the day, what they paid me for the last fight, they, they doubled it. So I'm like, sweet, let's get it on. Yeah. The fight was at Manchester Arena. Uh, got in there. So again, for this fight, we'd been away to America training, come back, I caught a little cut two weeks before the fight. Uh, there were talks of having to pull out. Uh, managed to disguise it. It was only a little nick, but you know, people like to get worried. Is it going to get worse? Is it going to open up in the fight? So it was a, a 10 round title fight for the central area. Anyway, we got through it, got to the fight. I remember weighing in against Nathan and looking at him, thinking, oh my God, he's massive. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd been away sparring, I really had too many tall sparring partners. It's intimidating, isn't it? Yeah, so anyway, first round, box nice, second round, boom, done him, sparked him. Uh, God bless Nathan, I still speak to him these days, good fella. Body shot? Uh, uh, iced him, left hand in the second round. They had to bring the, the gas on her out for him, Yeah. put it on, he got up. Do you know what I mean? And, and he were well after the fight, but that was kind of my little breakthrough fight at the time. It was a little statement made by me, so uh, that was one of his fighters that I'd managed to scalp. So you just took one of Frank's? So I took one of Frank's fighters, so I think this fight was in like July, so I was buzzing with that. Fought both undefeated, first test, come through it. A couple of weeks later, the phone rings, Tom Stalker. So my yeah. mate Tom <laughs> Hello, just Tom. been away with Tom this weekend you know what what a lovely fella uh, we get on me and Tom really yeah. well and he won't mind me telling you about the fight well, so, uh, so form rings just come just beat Nathan Bruff undefeated I think me and Tom was both 9-0 and at the time now undefeated 2012 Olympic captain touted for big things uh, got a phone call offered you double the money again let's do it do you know what I mean let's get it on uh, a bit more of a build up to this fight my first fight where I'd have to do like press conferences and take pictures and stuff we're talking 2014 now I think uh, got stuck into the training uh, and what I touched on earlier about being the away fighter although I was with Frank Warren the show was in Liverpool so Tom's hometown do you know what right my mate funny, funny, you, should, funny you should I didn't realise it was you that fought him I don't know if someone will know this. I think Darren Smith, my mate, sort of was doing a dive for him. On yeah. that, he's an nutritionist. Uh, on nice. That. I think he went to the show. But yeah, fucking hell, go on, tell us about that. Yeah, so again, come to Liverpool, done the press conference, the weigh-ins and that. And, uh, so you know what? Before the fight, me and my coach had been down to Tom's amateur gym, Everton Red Triangle, yeah. for months. And me and Tom had shared hundreds of rounds together. And I've talked to Tom about it since the fight. So when we were sparring, you know what it's like when you go in a different gym, and somebody comes to your gym, there's a little bit of animosity. Yeah. And you want to like, you want to win the spa, don't you? But I've always been in that mind frame from early that you've got to use the spa to your advantage and learn something from it. So as I was sparring Tom for all these months, in his head, he's probably thinking he's peppering me, but I'd been working on mastering my defence and perfecting everything. So when the fight got announced... It, like a little a light bulb pinged him there. I thought, you know what, I could beat him. Yeah. I could beat him. I was that confident. Come to Liverpool, uh, Echo Arena. First time that I'd like ever been booed. Obviously, you fought on these small hall shows and yeah. you've got your fans <laughs> with you. I remember walking to the ring and looking up at the crowd and that and I packed out Echo Arena. Yeah. Yeah, a few people booing and that, but got in the ring, we had a top scrap. I uh, think I had him down three times and then uh, finished in the seventh round. So you can imagine after that fight, then I took two of his fighters, uh, both undefeated, beat them. So he was undefeated, Tom, at the time? Tom was undefeated at the time. So you two back-to-back -back fighters, both undefeated. Uh, I think then you've earned your respect a little bit within the promotion. You know what? I was only like 23, 24. And they kind of like think something of you then. It was, uh, it was good looking back now. There's some of the best times I know. Everyone talks about the journey and there's no destination, so you've got to enjoy it. But looking back on them fights and that time now, I can look back with a smile and, you know, there was enjoyable moments in my career. Yeah, of course, of course. So what, what other significant fights happened after that? That sort of, 
So you've got two fights that you've beat, you know, two fighters you've beat that were undefeated, you've took them right out of the game, you've scalped them. Yeah, so then after that, I think... So you're getting noticed now. Getting noticed now, so still a young fighter, early 20s. Uh, I boxed amateur, but I didn't have a lot of amateur experience. I didn't fight around the world on the GB squad, so it was about building then. I've had my fights. Yeah, so you had, yeah. To, you had to build something. I've got, I've got my reputation now, it's, but it's about learning now. So there was a period then where... I think mine and Tom's fight was for the WBO European title. So I picked up that title and it was like, defend that title against international opponents, get a bit of international experience, fighters from Mexico, Argentina, uh, Latin Americans, and, and just gaining that experience, being on a few big undercards. Uh, it's a big step, in it, going from like, like homegrown stuff to international? Yeah, I'm fighting, fighting the, the, the Mexicans and the Argentinians. Yeah, of course. And you're a young fighter. I was in my early 20s and these fighters are, are older. And the men, I probably didn't feel like I grew into my me, into me frame until like my mid-20s probably. Mm. So you're fighting men and you're learning on the job. Uh, but it was enjoyable. So I racked up quite a few fights uh, internationally, learning my trade, uh, boxing different styles, different people from around the world. And it was good. And then comes a point then where you've got a, your rankings growing, your British rankings growing and there's, there's fighters knocking about now so you want to get stuck in domestically and get some good scraps going. Brilliant. So there was, God, I couldn't even put them in order now but I've had that many domestic scraps over the last uh, five years and they've took me up and down the country, uh, down south, been over to Belfast, great fight with Tyrone McKenna. Uh, again, that was an away day. Went over to Belfast to his hometown. Uh, funny story. I always remember a little kid. So, you know what? I, and I've said it to my girlfriend. That fight in Belfast was probably the best fight week I've ever had. Went over there. The weather was like it is today. It's beautiful, like, by the way. Mid twenties. The fight was on June the thirtieth. My yeah. birthday was July the first. Got there, beat him, good and proper. Woke up, it was my birthday, we're in Belfast, the sun's out. <laughs> All my family and friends were over, out on the Guinness, do you know what I mean? That, that was, uh, it was special, but the funny story was, walking walking to the ring, and Tyrone picked a mint song, you know, for his ring walks, we yeah. walked to the ring, I think it was, hit the road, Jack. Yeah. Quite uh, funny. <laughs> I mean, I always remember, I was uh, waiting to walk to the ring, I look up and I see a little kid, he's got a Tyrone McKenna t-shirt on, yeah. but he's with his parents, so he, I seen, him, I seen him look up at his mum and dad and he looks back there and he starts giving us the fingers but checking mum and dad weren't looking. I thought, you know what, that's brilliant. <laughs> that's fucking real. And then after that McKenna fight, uh, went on, won the British title. Uh, Tyrone Nurse up in Huddersfield on a Josh Warrington card in Leeds. Uh, won the British title. Went on to box O'Hara Davis, uh, who gets a lot of attention online. So that was nice to kind of like nip that in the bud and shut him up. Yeah. And then uh, after them fights, there was a period of probably like two years where pandemics come. Yeah, that was going on there. I mean, I'm it? in a good position. My ranking's in a good position, but it was always a catch-22. I'm waiting for a title shot. Nobody wants to pay you to fight in between. I'm kind of like stuck thinking like... All I want to do is fight. That's all I, all, all I enjoy doing. But it's come good. Last, last, like this last year, especially after that last fight, but a lot of uh, good things come from it. So there's going to be a lot of good things coming from this now, especially after the last fight you had with with Josh. You know, the, the people have you know the, they've seen the skills in a big way there. You know, so it's got to it's got to go. Even. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I feel like it escalates after that, hasn't it? It's got to explode somewhere. Yeah, of course. And I feel ready now. I feel like I always knew that I belonged at that world level, but I never had the opportunity to do it. Uh, and I've been preparing for that opportunity for a lifetime and it come, I've done it. And I think it, it's made people realise now, look, I am worthy of being in that top 10 with them top boys. I beat the pound for pound fighter. I didn't get the decision, but... I'm young enough now, I want to go on and win world titles. And there's no rematch, is there? No, so Josh got the rematch clause and I do believe if if the decision had gone the right way and I'd have got it on the night, 
that he would have called for the rematch. Obviously, it is what it is now. He yeah. won the fight. There's no rematch. No idea who's next on the cards? No, there's been talks. Uh, I'm in a good weight division with a lot of good fighters. Uh, was over watching Regis Progre fight my fellow opponent, Tyrone McKenna, at the weekend. So yeah. that's a potential fight. But there's a lot of good fights to be made. So it's about kicking on now, getting back in the gym and, and getting involved in them big fights. What do you think of the likes of Kid Galahad and Josh, uh, Josh Warrenson and Charles Dickens? And what do you think of this? Just any any idea of just your thoughts on them? Uh, I've met them all. I know them all personally. Jazz is a fucking major man, little Jazz. Yeah, Jazz is top stuff. <laughs> uh, you know what? He's been down to the gym sparring fighters at our gym for his fights. I like Jazz. Uh, yeah. I do. Got a lot of time for Jazz. Uh, kid, only met him a few times, seeing yeah. his fights. He'll come do, and... do you know what? That last fight with um, Jazz yeah, and, and Kid Galahad, I felt fucking. And I spoke to Jazz in a bar afterwards and. You know, there was a lot of schooling in that, really. It was sad. Um, and fucking hell, I was just, you know, I just root for the kid. You know, then he's gone into his next fight and just got destroyed, hasn't he? Yeah, it just box, boxing is so unpredictable. And yeah. we always say, don't one punch can change a fight. And it literally did in that fight. Yeah. Uh, and styles make fights. Uh, but no, Jazza proved, proved he's a top fighter. He'll come again. Yeah. Kid. I don't know what's going on with him. He seemed like he was back in the gym straight away. Yeah. Uh, and then this weekend, Josh Warrington uh, fighting Kiko Martinez. It's mad how these fights get made. And do you know what I mean? What so, do you think of his chances? I mean, obviously this will be this won't be out by. We'll know the result by the time this podcast is out. But you know, what what's your predictions of of the Warrington fight? Yeah. I think Warrington will beat him. Uh, don't get me wrong, it's a tough fight and Kiko proved he carries that, that knockout power. Yeah. Uh, Josh has beat him before. I think that will give him confidence going into the fight and especially after his last couple of fights, Josh knows now yeah. he's at that crossroads where he knows, you know what, if this doesn't go my way, am I going to get another world title opportunity? Exactly, yeah. Uh, and I've, well, I've, well, what I've seen of Josh, he can fucking fight, he can scrap. You know what, his work rate and yeah. he's... It's just like, he's, he's, just, he's, he's on you. He's explosive, he's, he's on you. Uh, his dad's been down to the gym with fighters over the last couple of weeks and getting a good feeling from his dad that he, everything's going the way it should be. So yeah. I'm excited. And you know what? We're always back our own, so I hope he can do it and uh, yeah. bring that world title back. That's it. You've got, um, you know, it's like like Liverpool. It's, it's got its, its, own, its own set of boxers that are doing really well. You know, Callum Schmidt, Beefy. He's up soon, Beefy. Beefy's fighting soon. Got the Vargas fight. Uh, me and Beefy, Callum as well, we've got the same strength coach, so I come over this way twice a week. I'm back here in the morning. Uh, shout out to Johnny, our strength yeah. coach, good guy. So I am I always get in before the boys, man. I like getting in nice and early. <laughs> I'll be up here in the morning, 8 o'clock, get my training done with Johnny. So where's uh, your training up these ways when you're up these? Yes, we're in... Uh, oh, you've put me on a spot now. What's the day of the gym? I thought it's on there. It, no, it's the, the gym that Till uses. Oh, it's... Oh, what's the name of it now? Tasha's yeah. gonna kill me because it's her uncle's gym. <laughs> oh, you better meet. No, it's it's gone. It's gone. <sighs> training station. Training station. Training station, Jim. Oh. Shout out to training station. In Waverley. Couldn't tell you where it yeah, is. I just yeah. put it on my sat nav and get there. Yeah, that, yeah, the training station. Yeah, I believe it's a, it's Darren a, Till's gym. What he uses at the back is it the MMA bit? Yeah, so it must be. I didn't realise you had a, a ring. Has he got a ring in there? In the... I have not been into the bit. They've got a cage in the back, I think. Yeah. Don't know if they've got a boxing ring. But so this is all weights, in it? This is all our weight oh, stuff, yeah. all explosive stuff. So we go to a training station. I know who uh, it is, mate. I'll be in there in the morning. It's Barry's uh, gym. Who's gym? Barry's. Is it? Barry and uh, Tinky Jonas. Yeah. Yeah. So we're in there in the morning, then Liam, Callum, and that. We've got all got the same strength coach. But yeah, it's uh, it's all good. So what are your thoughts on um, on on Beefy's fight coming up with Vargas? I think he's just got too much at the moment, Liam. The momentum he's had, yeah. Uh, the last couple of fights, he seems like he's got his hunger back. Yeah. Uh, I know Vargas has been out the ring for a little bit and he's involved in like political campaigns, but yeah. I think when you've got somebody so stubborn like Liam, yeah. so determined, once he's got it in his head and the way he's been performing, the momentum he's got. 
I think he does it, and I think yeah, he does he's, it. He's, it does it inside twelve rounds. I he's, believe he's, he's, he's got the style, Ali. He's yeah. good. He's great. Dad. You know, his dad, Ali. His dad. He's a good friend of his dad, Paul. Paul's a um, lovely fella. Big Paul. Good family as with yeah. Paul. Paul Smith Junior. At the weekend, uh, Paul commentating Sean. on the fights with him yeah, over Sean. in Dubai. Yeah. So no, brilliant family and a uh, lot of respect for him. Callum, was gutted. Very well up against um, Canelo. Oh. I think he just survived that fight. It was just, a, it was just a really, he was doing well not to go down. To be fair, you know what? How, how tough is Callum? And you've, to, see, to you've seen Canelo. He, he finishes a lot of fighters, doesn't he? he finishes and Callum's them, arm had, had come his bicep. I think it was. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what he was attacking his arm. Yeah, like he was attacking his arm. Because he's like, he's more like, a, he reminds me of like Marvin Agla, Callum. Mm. You know, he's got that style where it's, he's got a big, long, big, long reach. Yeah. You know what? He'd give a good account of yourself. You, yeah. Canelo's a phenomenal fighter. And, and the, out of this you're, world, you're fighting like the best fighter on the planet. But I, I believe Callum's in the gym training. He, he'll be back out soon, I think. Yeah, definitely, definitely. He's got to be back and on I the And I think cares. he'll be the same now. It's... Uh, his ambitions will be world titles again, and oh. I think he belongs at that level no no matter what. So who, who was your um, who was your inspiration as a boxer growing up? What boxers? Uh, that's yeah. Well, if mine was like Roberto Duran, was the super four, Ernst, yeah, Agler, Sugar Ray Leonard. I had that um, Tyson. You know, I yeah. grew up around around them. You you so, probably grew up around fucking like who? Nigel Bennon. Yeah. So, but. So I've always been watching the Mike Tyson videos. Tyson was is my favourite fighter. Uh, but you know what? I didn't follow it massively until recent years. Not recent years, last 10 years or so. Yeah. So I, apart from Mike Tyson, there wasn't many fighters that I watched growing up until I turned professional and started watching the boxing and, and picking out fighters that I like watching. And even to now, just, just watching fighters and clips on YouTube and picking up stuff. Yeah. But yeah, Tyson was definitely, I remember my dad owned a clothes shop in town. So used to go there, sort of finish school at three o'clock. Boxing started at half five. So used to get my gym bag, go down to my dad's shop, spend a little time there, have a brew, have an hour before I go to the gym. I used to get on the laptop and, and just watch Mike Tyson press conferences and knockouts and stuff. But yeah, I always enjoyed watching Mike. Please, I've had a good few uh, Xboxes on the show, you know, big shout out to Courtney Fry, Jamie Moore, Tony Dodson, Tony Quigley, Swifty, yeah. um, Jazza, you know, the list is endless. Um, and it's been just really, I was just really fucking like intrigued to see how, like, like yourself, but it's a different kind of, it's, it's a different kind of way of living. Yeah. You know, your whole way of living is now like diet, nutrition, strength and conditioning. You know, you've got a lot to deal with these days than you did. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you'll know more than me, but from what you picture back training years ago was you go to the boxing gym, you spar, you hit the bags, you run, that's it. We never had a diet. You never had a diet? No, we never got told to fucking... Just had to make weight, that was it. It wasn't told. We never had no nutritionist, no strength and conditioning. It's mad, I'm it? telling you, right, right. Here's the day in, in, day in the life of me, go to the gym, Stays in for the run, right? The bags, and then it'll be it'll be the pads, and then it'll be sparring, a few bit of skipping, all that kind of stuff that was going on. We do that three, four times a week, and when in between you do your own runs, yeah, right. So you you'd run on the days you weren't coming, so you you were keeping, you were taking over. Then you were told, right, you've got a fight coming up. You'd get on the scales. I, I was well, fucking well, I don't know, eight stone. You know, you that that was yeah. it. I didn't. No one ever said, right? You're too heavy. You're too light. <laughs> you're like, oh, you're gonna be fighting him. That's it. We'll just ma it. they'll match you. They were matching you with someone like the similar weight, and that was how it was. And you had the card. You know what I mean? I remember going there and I'm like, I was going in with kids who were dead tall. You know what I mean? I yeah. was like yourself thinking, fucking hell, how am I gonna do? Um, am I gonna beat this kid? And I remember me. I think it was my third fight. I was in St George's Hotel. Above and it was a dinner show. And it, there was all kinds of celebs there, and it was all kind of belts of food and what have you, and they were all around the table in suits, and you know we were in the ring, and there was this my opponent, he was quite tall, and I, was, I felt intimidated, and I, he had all badges all over his shorts and his vest. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I'd only had three fights, and I was like, what the fuck has he got there, John? John Rice, big shout out to John. Um, he was my coach, and um, 
he went, oh, I don't worry about them bill. They're just like swimming fucking badges and yeah. fucking camping badges. There, and he had fucking badges everywhere. It's mad. At but he, he said to me, he said, you need to, what you need to do with this kid, right? He said, you need to go in, aim just a big right cross to the stomach bang and a hook. Keep doing that because he's wide open all the time. He keeps dropping that. And that's how I did. And, and I won that fight. I don't know. It was on, it was on a, a, like a decision. But do you know what? It's, it's, it's about listening as well. And I think that's the thing that we lack as well when we're in the ring. It's, it's difficult to sit in yeah. the corner and go, you do this. You see it in every fight in the corner. Get in there. Bah, 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 bah. What's your thoughts on that? When you're sitting there and you're exhausted, right? You've been punched fucking dozens of times. You've got Travis or Jamie or someone in the corner going, oh, fucking hell, Jack, this is what you need to do. You need to get in there and you need to let off this. Are you focused? Is your mind? Yeah, I think... So the way I look at it is the fight's been announced. Yeah. We've done everything that we possibly can. We've watched the Josh Taylor DVDs. We've done everything I can do to, to the best of my ability. We've, yeah. we've we've covered all bases. So when you're in the fight, and I know you get fighters that sometimes listen to the coach. A fighter recently listening to the coach's advice that was way off and he got beat. Yeah. Right, so... I think you got to take it on yourself as a responsibility. I'm the fighter, I'm in the ring. You've got to be able to adapt to anything. So you go back to the corner after round one, maybe a little sip of water, take your breath. You do listen to the advice, but end of the day, he's only giving you advice from the outside. As a fighter, you're in the ring. You, you, you're the one controlling what's happening. So sometimes it's, you take the advice on board, but ultimately you know whether you can do what they're saying or not. So, I don't know. I guess everybody reads it different, don't they? But mm. I was thinking, if we've done everything we need to in the gym, whether Jamie's at the fight or not, I know what I need to do. We've worked yeah. on it for fucking 12, 15 weeks. I'll go out there and do that. Yeah. As soon as the fel first bell goes and you get popped in the face, like, it changes the fight, doesn't it? So you've got to be able to adapt and overcome things like Tyson, second by yeah. second, don't you? It's like Tyson said, then everyone's got a plan until you get punched Everybody's in the face. Everybody's got a plan until you get You've got it. a plan until you get fucking sparked, lad. That's <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. And I, you know, for me, it was like, I had my, my problem was, right, I used to throw a flurry of punches and, and I'd come, you know, if I hit him with a good shot, I'd stand back and admire it. Yeah. And this is something me, me saying, used to say, why the fuck do you stand back? And admire that shot. Uh, Why don't you follow through? I don't know where it come from. It's just like, and you know, on the flip side to you, what I've probably made a mistake in doing previous is because I've worked on my defence for that long. Yeah. Watch fighters, Pernell Whitaker, Floyd Mayer, and I always like to think, you know what? The rule of the game is hit and don't get hit. Yeah. But sometimes I've made the mistakes of being that comfortable, knowing that they can't hit me. Complacent. Like yeah. you. Yeah. You know what? They've gone blah 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 then it's your time to go again isn't it yeah. you need to put, put it back on them <laughs> and that's what that's what my uh, don't think I had that killer instinct to be fair I don't I my you know my journey in boxing was quite brief I enjoyed it I, I tried I tried to, to to reignite the engine like a decade later in Thailand and it was so old you at that point I was in my 30s then Right. So I, I, by this time, I'd spent a lot of time in prison in between. You know, my, yeah. my, my journey went, see, this is where I'm, I'm, we, we talk about discipline with yourself and, you know, you've got your routine and you've got you've got a life now, you've got goals and your dreams. You wanted to be in the army. I did. Yeah. You know, that was one of my, um, I, I joined the, the cadets as a young kid. My brother didn't want to be in the army whatsoever. He wasn't interested. He was into all heavy metal bands and everything, big long wig and everything. <laughs> Met a girl. The relationship broke up. He couldn't deal with the fucking feelings and ended up being in the army for 25 years. No way. Right, so, and he became like a, a regimental sergeant, fought all over the world. I ended up in and out of prisons and institutions. I know, right, I know this story's not about me before anyone starts. <laughs> fucking age your story. Yeah, you have, and I'm not telling my story. I'm just identifying, by the way, because that's the issue. You know, we, we, we can identify. So, I, what, what kind of, did, was there any time that, like, your path, did you feel it was going to go a different way from boxing? Did you ever, was there any like drugs or drink or, or crime? Because when I spoke to Jamie, you know, Jamie was talking about growing up, and, you know, 
there was a few things that were nearly hit, me, hit and yeah. miss with them. You know what I mean? But was there any kind of hit and misses with you? Was there any like influences or peer pressure? And how did you deal with it? Nah, do you know what? We've got circles of friends and some people are up to some stuff and the other, but you know what? I think I've got that good of a, a network and family that that, I've, that I didn't go down that route. And, and don't get me wrong, when we was younger, we all messed about and stuff, but... Did you ever sniff glue? Never sniff glue. No, <laughs> <laughs> no not yet, anyway. There's time, but nah. Uh, there probably has been in points where you think, for me, it was more of growing up and not going into that kind of life, but is boxing going to be able to to deliver the life I want to live? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You've got to move out, you've got to pay your bills, pay your mortgage, and uh, you're thinking you're not earning great though, so you're like, there was that, but nah. I've uh, got a lot of friends, and they wouldn't even invite us on a night out. Now, I'd go out on a night out, but they respect me enough to say, you know what, you don't need to be out with us, we don't need to be in a pub drinking. Yeah. Do you know what? So I respect them for that. And that's what you call friends, and and this is like there's a lot of people that watch this, and a lot of questions get asked, and you know, you know, seeking guidance and support, and and, and the, a positive way of life, because this is what it's about. It's about having a positive platform, you know, not inciting any kind of violence or promoting drug addiction of any sort. So I, I kind of enjoyed the fact that I got the opportunity to to talk about this stuff, which is like the likes of yourself, yeah, and, and how did you deal with it? And it seems to me like you've got a group of friends who've shown you, you know, that, that kind of support that you need. Yeah, I think, I think I'm a good judge of character. The certain people over the years that you cut off that you don't need to be associated with. But, and I think the friends that I do keep now respect me enough and you are the company you keep at. A lot of my friends are into sports and, yeah. and, and doing stuff and business, etc. So, that's the company that I want to be around. Uh, people who are positive, who are going to have a positive impact on my life. Yeah, there's a lot of, there's, there's, you know, over the years, there's, there's been a few boxers that have kind of succumbed, you know, with really great talents and skills that I know. Yeah. Right, that could have been world champions. And me, there's a lot, in there. Yeah, they, they could have had, you know, amazing opportunities of, it's like, even like, the, like Billy Kenny, footballers, you know, superstar, Everton player, had the world's at his feet, bang, went down the wrong path, lost everything. There's things like that. There's, there's, I suppose there's boxers that have, that have gone down that route as yeah, well. There's a lot of fighters, there's a lot of fighters. Who was the in recent times that's happened? To, is that anything happened to boxers? Do you know anyone? Have you there? I don't want to p- pinpoint any names in particular, but you've, we've seen it time and time again, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, the most talented fighters. Uh, and they know they're talented, but they, do you know what I mean? They, they end up down the wrong path and they don't put the work in and then you get yeah. the fighters that are maybe not half as talented, who are consistent, who are hard workers, who will get them opportunities. Yeah. Big shout out to Colin Zone, by the way. I don't know if you know Colin Zone. Colin was on here recently. Colin, Colin Dynamo Zone. You'll have to have a look at him. He reminds me of yourself, really, to be fair. Yeah. He was, um, he came on and he's, I think he's a little bit older than me. But um, I'm sure he was in your ways as well, to be honest. But he was a fucking incredible fighter. I mean, he was one of those things explosive on you all the time. Yeah. You know, um, he was actually a jockey. Was he? Yeah, he was actually a, you know, a jockey before he became no, a fighter. Yeah. So he's, he was quite small. Um, but have a little look at him. Yeah, I'll, we'll I'll, I forgot to mention Colin then in the list. And Paddy, Paddy Lacey. Do you know Paddy? Yeah, I don't know Paddy. Paddy... Right, Paddy's another, he's a young kid. I think he's about the same age as yourself. Right. But he went, you know, his, his pod's on my on my platform, but he went from, like, like a, pro- a professional footballer to going to jail to becoming a professional boxer under Eddie Ayn, I think. He's wow. A, he's at, um, I think he's 4-0 now. Right, right, so I'll, I'll have to have a look out. Paddy's, Paddy's, and these are all scousers, by yeah. the way. Paddy what? Paddy Lacey. Paddy Lacey. Have, have, a little, have, a, have a little nose. I'm, yeah. I'm names dropping and I've picked these names yeah. up. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just nice. I just feel it's nice to get the opportunity no, to meet people. Of course, these, it is. It's, it's nice to help people and, and get the name out there. And yeah. Jamie always says it pay it forward. Don't, if you're in a position like we are now to, to shout people out, why not? Yeah, that's it. You know, you're on a platform. And it's. Um, what would you like to do? Right, so. 
Yeah. How long have we been on me? So we've, we've had, had a good little chat of something, haven't we? Yeah. So, what would you like to do once your career's ended? Because obviously, it, it, there's, there's a fucking time management, there's a time limit, there's an in boxing. Yeah, so I'm 28 now. I'm at that stage where I probably shouldn't be thinking about retiring, but you have to in a real world, don't you? It's um, mid-30s, isn't it? Yeah, so I know next couple of years, if I, if I look after my body, stay disciplined, I can have another good four, five, six years fighting uh, and I want to be involved in some big fights. But after boxing, it'd be nice to, to pay it back then to, to fighters and young kids coming through. I'm an ambassador for a local children's hospice, shout out Darien House. Uh, and they do incredible also. things for, for children with, with life-ending illnesses. So I think something along them lines, giving back, I think that's what we're here for. Uh, at the moment, I'm entertaining, I'm fighting on TV, but it'd be nice to, to give something back. Do you feel that rewards your soul when you spit it? Yeah, when you give a little million bit percent. Back. I think if you're in position to help somebody, the feeling you get from it, uh, and I know you see a lot of shit online, don't you, about people taking the pictures. It's not about that. It's about doing no, it for... Do you know what? There's a lot of like uh, social media fucking blades who are throwing bouquets at themselves yeah, and, fucking and influencers jumping in front of it. It's just, it's just you for don't effect. Have, you don't have to tell nobody. No. Do you know what? You're right. Do something nice for someone, but keep it to yourself. Exactly. So, yeah, I think something along them lines, uh, giving back charity work. I don't know there's... I built up a good network of people, so there'll be opportunities to, to do a lot of stuff after boxing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's going to be plenty of stuff for you to, to get involved with uh, once you've, you know, you're in a position to school the young kids as well. Of course, if, if I've got a big enough platform, which is building now, and... Uh, I'll put all your, your links as yeah, well. you can the, reach a wider audience, and if you can help that one person, then... Job done, isn't it? So you're on uh, Twitter, social media. Twitter, uh, Facebook and Instagram. You're on all three I'm of them. All three of them. Right, so I'll, have to, I'll put all your, your links within the description anyway at the end. Oh, thank you. So that'll be on the bottom of the, the podcast. So when you link in the description, all Jack's details will be in there. Right, we're coming to the end, Jack. I don't know what more. You're a young kid, right? Yeah. You, you've done fucking really well. I've really enjoyed. No, you I know, appreciate you having us on. It's a privilege. Time. But he always says it to, to my guests at the end of the podcast. I've always asked them one question. It's a pale of wisdom, right? So what would you say, right, now think about this, yeah? What would you say to a young Jack Cattle walking through the doors of life, right? If you've seen yourself walking through the doors of life and you had this, you know, opportunity to say something positive, what would you offer? I'd have to say enjoy every moment the good, the bad, the ugly, they're all lessons and they all shape us, who we are today. You have days where you're down and you beat up about stuff, but does it matter now, two months later, five years later, enjoy everything and, and make the memories. Brilliant. And with that, the world champ, Jack Cattle. Thank you very much. Nice one. Nice one, Appreciate mate. That.